I think at some level, this is something we decided almost centuries ago. Um, you know, people thought it was absurd to have a democracy where people couldn't read. Um, and I think if you apply that today to the 21st century, it's absurd that we have people consuming so much media, but without an education system, teaching them how to be literate within it. Uh, and so I think it's not really that radical or new of an idea, just the diversity of, and amount of media have changed. Um, some studies show folks consuming somewhere between 10 and 16 hours of media a day, given the average person sleeps between six and eight. That basically means while you're awake, uh, you're using media, which means media has a huge influence on how we see the world, our perceptions, and how we participate in that world as well. And so anybody who cares about uh, democracy or human autonomy must equip the citizenry with the skills to be able to navigate this heavily mediated environment. Um, the reason why the critical angle is so important is that there's a lot of people who will echo my same desire to see media literacy, but they're more interested in teaching people how to use and become dependent upon digital tools, where I'm more interested and teaching them how to investigate the power dynamics of these tools so they can use them as a more responsible citizen. And in the US, that's the difference between the so-called critical and acritical folks. The, the acritical folks, uh, they usually walk or echo the corporate line. Uh, they think it's exciting that young people can open up social media accounts or can um, participate you know, in the AI revolution. Um, those of us in the critical camp, we still think there's something important for using these tools. It's okay to get pleasure from these tools and like these tools, but we're really doing a disservice to users when they're not aware of the power dynamics behind these tools. Um, so to give a quick example, you know, an acritical framework would say that users are empowered because they're on social media, creating things and sharing their ideas. A critical perspective might say, no, actually, I think social media users are largely exploited. They're doing free and unpaid labor. They're giving up their privacy in the process. Uh, they have the delusion of power when, in fact, the power lies in the platform creator who controls the algorithm. So that's kind of an example of the substantive differences between the critical and acritical approach. When it comes to the idea of, of free press or independent um, journalism, I think at some level we've sort of overthought this. Um, you know, basic journalistic ethos says that journalists are supposed to act independently. And when you have a corporate behemoth who your job and livelihood depend on, it's tough to act independently because you don't want to do anything to upset those power structures. And so, you know, maybe at some level, some corporate media is fine as long as it's balanced by independent media in, in a society. But that's not where we're at now. Um, you know, upwards of 90 percent of our media are controlled by by corporate entities. And we've seen historically time and time again that they will suppress um, destroy, dismiss, or attack stories that critique their existing power or their wealth. And so that leaves journalists with very little to cover. If they're not going to go after the powerful and they're only going to be able to cover uh, information that doesn't upset those in power, you end up with weak fluff stories. We debate whether or not Donald Trump's tweets are racist and things like that, but we don't actually get at existing power structures um, within the society. So in that sense, Independent journalists are, are critical. For those of us who are news literate, that's where we go. Uh, these are folks you know we can depend on who really believe in the art of journalism, really believe in democracy. Um, they use those constitutional protections to inform the public and strengthen democracy. And at some level, we have uh, kind of a quality problem. Um, it's, it's not a problem of um, creating independent journalists. We're lucky enough in this nation to have a ton of great independent journalists. The problem is really how do you sift through the nonsense, uh, the din of corporate propaganda and find those independent journalists. And so that's what we try and do in the critical media literacy space is say, look, here's how you evaluate these individuals and organizations. And hopefully you'll gravitate toward those who have a record of reporting truth over falsehood. Well, this is where I'll, I'll sort of go out on a on a limb. I think um, I think I think scholars usually do themselves no service when they predict the future, largely because they're wrong. And I've been wrong about predicting the future as well. But um, in, in terms of uh, the election, I think we're at an interesting um, transition point with journalism um, that's really going to be important context for understanding this election. Um, I think it's no secret at this point that folks know that 
people of all ages, young and old and in between, have abandoned uh, legacy media in huge numbers and they're going to the internet. And there's some problems with that. People think that social media platforms are news outlets. But at the same time, there's a thriving market for these independent journalists who are creating like streaming services or podcasts or their own like sub stacks. And uh, obviously that that could change. But right now, these folks are drawing a lot of attention and they're being highly influential. And you see like even, you know, sitting Congress people are or even people running for office like Ron DeSantis. They're going on these programs that would not have happened 10 years ago. They would not go on some ragtag podcast or talk to some sub stacker. Um, but I, I think we're starting to see that that transition. So this will be an interesting um, test to see how strong the grip of corporate media is in, in 2024. Is it going to continue to be the most influential um, news outlets as it has been the last handful of elections? Or will will new media be a decisive factor? And that, that's something I think is interesting in the 2024 context. I guess I would go down the route of, you know, advice and, and you know, uh, elections don't matter, I think, as much as we say they matter. Um, we have, you know, a warped sense of elections that somehow we're going to be able just to elect the right person at the right time and all the problems will be solved. It, really, electoral politics is about voting in the person you think you have the best shot of agitating and annoying to get to do what you want. And, um, you know, you can look at the what we're seeing as the two candidates and you can decide what your agenda is and who you think has a better shot of, of agitating and annoying to get to do what you want. So I don't get too excited about elections or who wins or who loses. What I, what I look for is, you know, what are the activist community doing? Who's out there in the streets putting pressure on these people in positions of power? And in that sense, um, I really see a lot of the energy in folks who are pro-choice. Um, you know, we've seen historic electoral outcomes since the Dobbs decisions in places like Kansas and Kentucky and elsewhere, where, you know, these ruby red states are producing victories for liberals and, and Team Blue and the Democrats. Um, and so I think that's where a lot of the energy is. So I'm more interested in, in sort of focused on those people who are, who are hitting the streets and trying to pressure elected officials or have passion about particular policies. The politicians for me, they're they're just, you know, they're there to distract us.